chapter 1. Don't all you guys kind of wish you'd taken a picture of your son like that? That's a man thing, I know. Okay, Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to be looking specifically at uh, verses 7 through 12, but to get the context, I want to begin at the beginning, and we'll read through uh, verse 14. And I've entitled the message, Appointed for His Glory. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, Having believed, you are marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. And Lord, it is stunning what's recorded in this passage for us. The revelation of Christ and the gift that you've given and the blessings that you bestow. And Father, I pray that somehow, God, greater clarity than ever before would come to our hearts and our minds in understanding the great gifts that you've provided for us in Jesus Christ. So open our, open our hearts, open our minds. Father, I pray that you'd open my mouth and, and let your word go out. Father, the very heartbeat that you've got for your bride, God, let that come across. And so we want to say thank you in advance for this passage. And we pray in every way that you'd be glorified and the church would be edified. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. When I read this passage, one of the first things that comes to my mind is that this has got to be too good to be true. This just doesn't seem possible that God would do all these things. In fact, I'll be honest with you, even as a, a believer, having walked with the Lord for a long time, I still have trouble wrapping my mind around the truths that are contained in these 14 verses. And by the way, uh, this is, uh, may, may surprise you, but this is actually one sentence in Greek. Uh, there's no punctuation in the Greek when it comes to this sentence. It's just an explosion of praise that Paul lays out in front of the churches in Asia Minor to tell them about the greatness and the love and the power and the blessings that God has given us in Jesus Christ. But when I hear something that almost sounds too good to be true, I, I'm cautious. I, I remember getting my first Nigerian scam email about 10 years ago. You guys all got scammed by the Nigerians? Everybody receive one of those? Okay, if you haven't, I can forward a few to you because I, uh, I kept one just for humor's sake. But the Nigerian scam is basically, you know, some widow of some high-ranking general in the Nigerian army scrolled away $25 million, and now uh, everyone's trying to flee the country. There's a change in the government, and uh, she's looking for someone that can help transfer these funds into, a, into the United States fund. And, uh, and so, but there's a few problems, of course. There's always a problem. And uh, one of the problems is there's some attorney fees that she can't afford right now because all of her money is tied up and she can't get access to it. It can only be transferred electronically. And so the story goes, and then you have to give 5,000 for this and 10,000 for that. But everybody's thinking, wow, you know, that's a small price to pay for 20%, because that's usually what the offer is. 20% of the 25 million is yours if you simply will allow your bank account to be used to transfer these funds into until she makes her journey over here and, and, and then can recover those funds. Uh, you, you, 
I, it's mind-numbing that people actually go for this stuff, but it's $100 million a year in revenue for Nigeria uh, that's taken from the United States alone. $100 million of people just like us get taken by these scams. Um, I, I was stunned because about five years later, there's a new scam for pastors. It's for churches, particularly designed to to uh, draw the pastors and leaders in, uh, that they want to do the same thing, but they feel led to give this money to the church. They don't want to keep it themselves. They know it's kind of blood money, and so they want it to go to the church. They want to do something proactive with it, and so it's the same story. And, of course, it is too good to be true. And, um, uh, you know, my wife has become kind of an expert at ferreting this stuff out because we have rental units, and, uh, and they do the same thing on Craigslist. Have you guys noticed that about Craigslist? You, you, you advertise something on Craigslist, and then you get more of these people. I don't know how they find everybody, but they, they go on there, and they're constantly patrolling the, the web to rip people off. And so when we come across a passage like this, if I didn't know better, and I didn't know Christ, and I hadn't been walking with the Lord so long, I'd say, could this possibly be true? Is what Paul is saying in this passage, is this even remotely possible that God would, for us, people like us, and you know what you're like, I know what I'm like, that he would be so generous and so kind and so rich in his, in his pouring out toward those that call on his name. And yet we find that Paul, in this explosion of praise for God and a revelation to the church of this kindness of God, he maps out for us some, not all, but some of the blessings that God has given us. And so we've talked about the fact that all of these blessings find their origin in God the Father, who the Bible tells us chose us. And he chose us to be holy and without blame before him in love. And he predestined us to receive adoptions as sons and daughters of God. And he accepted us in Christ. That word accepted is the very same word that was used of Mary, the mother of Jesus, by Gabriel and said, you are highly favored. That's the word here in the Greek. You are highly favored. You know, I remember reading about Mary and I thought, wow, I don't know if there's anywhere else in the Bible that it says that a man or woman is highly favored by God. But do you know who God says are, is highly favored? The saints. And you know who the saints are? It's you. We talked about the fact that it's not by the Catholic definition of what a saint is. God says the church, the believer who's come into this profound relationship with Christ is referred to as a saint set apart for God. And by virtue of being set apart, all of these interests and these values accrue to us. So the, the key in all of this passage, though, is the fact that these blessings are not ours because of any, anything we bring to the table. In fact, it's in despite of our demerit. It's in spite of our sin that we receive these blessings. These blessings can only be experienced in Christ. They can only be experienced in Christ. And so we're told that we're blessed in the heavenly realms in Christ. We're chosen by God because we are in Christ. We're adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ. And we have been made acceptable to God in the one he loves, Jesus Christ. And so I shared with you last week the illustration of the Trojan horse and, um, and the, the war that was being fought between Rome and the Greeks, and how the Greeks for 10 years were building siege ramps against the city of Troy, and they could not penetrate. They could not get in. And, uh, and so they built this monstrosity of a horse. It was a masterpiece work of art. And then they got in their ships and sailed away and made it appear that they were giving up on the, on the adventure of trying to get in uh, to the city of Troy. And so... After a period of time and the ship sailed around the corner, the, the Romans came out of their city and they pulled in their prize, valuable spoil from the war, this giant horse, not knowing, of course, that inside were warriors. And they pulled it in. And during the night watches, the ships came back, disembarked. The men came up the hill, came to the gates of Troy, and the men that had been inside had opened the gates, and that's how the city of Troy was defeated. And I related that in a positive way, how God in Christ sent his son into enemy territory, because that's what happened. Jesus Christ left the, 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 the presence of God, and he came to a hostile environment, to a hostile world where we were enemies of God, whether we knew we were or not. The Bible says that if we are not in Christ, we are at enmity with Christ. And on the outside, Jesus came to us, and in essence, built a Trojan horse for us 
in the, in the experience of the cross. And by virtue of our simply believing, we enter into Christ, and then God the Father brings the spoil of war in, his son, and in the bowels of that person of Jesus Christ, having died on the cross, is the church. And we enter in. And the way that we enter in is simply by believing. So the concept of staying in Christ or abiding isn't this work of our flesh, and I'm, I'm in, I'm out, I'm in, I'm out, I'm doing good, I'm not doing good. It really just boils down to the simple thing, have you believed? And do you believe in Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross? And if you believe, the Bible says that now you are found in Christ, clothed in his righteousness. It's the same principle that was foreshadowing the work of Christ in the Old Testament in the ark in Noah's day. And all they had to do was get in the boat. You notice we don't hear a whole lot about Noah. We know he was a righteous man, but, but the fact is, is that we don't, we didn't, Noah didn't earn his way into the ark. God sovereignly selected his family. And they got in. That's all they had to do, just get in the boat. And he believed what God said, and they got in the boat. And so for us as New Testament believers, the simple truth, the astonishing truth, is that if you want eternal life and you want to be received in the kingdom of God, the message is simply believe. And that is such a hard message even for Christians to accept because we feel like, okay, I believe. Now I want to somehow get God's approval that I deserve to be in this boat, that I deserve to be in the kingdom of God. And God says, no, it's simply based on belief. And having believed, we're told in verse 7 that in him we have redemption through his blood, in Christ. By virtue of being in Christ, we, we, we enjoy the benefits that come as a result of his ministry. And one of, the, one of the benefits that's laid out here is that we have redemption. Do any of you watch Pawn Stars? Am I the only one that watches that? It's kind of a cool show. I, I, it's kind of got history in it. It's got some little bit of drama. It's fun to watch. So sometimes I watch it, but you know, if you've ever gone to a pawn, a, a pawn shop, what you do is you take something valuable in, you leave it with the guy, and you say, you know, I need money. I'm desperate. I've got to pay my bill. I'm behind on my rent, whatever it is, and I'll give you this. You hold it for me. It's more valuable than the money that I'm asking for, and uh, you'll hold it for me, and I'll come back and pay you back in two weeks, and I'll give you 20% over and above what you loan me. That's how a pawn store works. And, uh, and in essence, what's happened is that Satan, in cooperation with mankind, has, has experienced this forfeiture of the, of the work of God in, in the world. Because of our sin, we forfeited what God had planned for us, and instead we received what Satan had planned for us, and we ended up in a pawn shop, if I can put it in those terms. We, we, we're pawn goods, and we're sitting on the shelf hoping our master will come back and redeem us. And what God did in Christ on the cross is that he paid the redemption price, and it was very high. It was extremely high. It was so high that it, was, it pronounces a value over those, those goods, people, in the pawn shop that is far more significant than the intrinsic value of each individual because the sin and the payment for sin was astronomical. It was the, the price of the life of the Son of God. And the Bible tells us that in Christ we were redeemed. And he took us out of hawk. He got us back for himself and purchased us. And we're told that this purchase, this redemption, and the source of redemption is in the person of Jesus Christ. It was through him that redemption came. And we're told the basis of that redemption was the blood of Jesus Christ. His blood. It's interesting that... Um, the Old Testament, of course, is filled with foreshadowings of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. That's what the whole sacrificial system is about. I know if you're a newer believer, you start reading through some of that stuff, and it seems like, wow, I don't understand all this. What is all this pointing to? If I can just tell you in summary, all of it is pointing to Jesus. It was to prepare the people of Israel so that when the Messiah came, they understood the need for a sacrifice. The Bible tells us in Hebrew and Leviticus that that. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. You know, we think of our sin as not that bad. But the Bible says otherwise. Our sins destroy relationship with God. Our sins separate us from a holy God. 
That's how holy and pure he is, is that when Adam and Eve ate of the fruit in the Garden of Eden, he told them, you can't live here anymore because I'm perfect in holiness, and now you are no longer perfect in holiness. But God made a plan and, and had a, a, a plan before even time began for the redemption of mankind. And it would come through the sacrifice of Christ who would be the Lamb of God and who would shed his blood having made propitiation or payment for what would otherwise be our penalty. And all of us, you guys know my little phrase, I, I should be burning in hell. That, that's my destiny. That's what I deserve because of my sin. And if I can say it, Without offending you, well, I'm not sure if I'm worried about that either, but you should be burning in hell for what you've done. And it's only because of the grace of God and the blood of Christ that we believe in, and now having believed, we find ourselves in Christ. And so whatever Christ is, is what we benefit from. We're beneficiaries of his relationship with God. We're beneficiaries of his inheritance that's coming. We're beneficiaries of this relationship, this newfound relationship that we have as sons and daughters of God. And it's all because we are found in Christ. He says, in, um, as you kind of keep looking here, oh, my pages are kind of flipping around here, that we have the forgiveness of sins, and, and it's in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us, with all wisdom. And so, again, the, the goal of redemption was that we would be forgiven of sins. This word in the Greek has to do with not only the, the source and the, the nature of sin itself, because we're all, by nature, sinful people, but also the actions that accompany the sinful nature. God forgives the past and the present and the future. And that's not an easy concept to actually uh, understand fully and to appreciate. But he does Forgive our past and our present and our future. And I want to park on this just for a minute because it, there's two problems with this theology and doctrine that the Bible pronounces to us. The first problem that we have is, is it, is it really possible for God to give, forgive our past, we believe, our present, maybe, our future? That seems like something, something's wrong with that. The second problem we, that we have is it seems to open the door for continued lifestyle of disobedience to God because we know we've got 1 John 1, 9 in our back pocket that we can refer to that God will forgive us if we confess our sins. And so it seems to lend itself toward a carnal lifestyle that runs in direct opposition to and violation of the purposes of God. But the, the beauty of this doctrine that's clearly pronounced in Scripture is that if you remain in Christ, and how do we remain in Christ? What do we have to do? We have to believe. It doesn't say anything about our performance. So if remaining in Christ is the key, and simply by believing in Jesus Christ is the way that we enter the kingdom, then that's the way that we stay in the kingdom, and that's the way we have the hope of the eternal kingdom, is not by performing now that we're saved, but simply by believing. It's by faith from first to last, as Paul says in the book of Romans. So I don't know what, how you feel about that. I don't know how difficult that is for you to absorb. But this is what the Bible says. And so we need to rest in that. So those of you that are, you know, type A, worker B Christians that feel like you've got to have all your ducks in a row, and if you don't, you're not good with Christ, and then if you do, you're okay with Christ, and if you're underperforming, you feel bad about yourself, that has to be a thing of the past, because if you are in Christ, you reap all the benefits of that relationship, whether you're deserving or not. Because in the first place, were you deserving? Of course not. So how can you now, or how can I now, bring myself to a point where now I am deserving? I can't ever be deserving. I have to come by faith, and I have to stay there by faith and simply believe in this finished work and find myself in Christ and be satisfied that his righteousness is enough. Now, on the other extreme of this are the people that sometimes want to you know, just continue to live a lifestyle that dishonors God. They're not fully appreciating the costliness of our salvation. And in essence, they want to kind of sell themselves back into the pawn shop over and over and over and have God rescue them again and again and again. But they don't realize that the place that they're supposed to be is not with, you know, all kinds of people coming in and shopping and looking at them and handling that, 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 uh, that person's life with, without care or concern and trying to offer the lowest price that they can get for that person's life 
but they're called by God Almighty who considers them precious and of great value. And they want to walk away from that. And, and that doesn't make sense because in Romans chapter 12, it tells us that in view of this kind of mercy that God gives us, this kind of great love that the, that the Father has toward us, that our response should be to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. That's the proper response. So if you're, if you're the kind of person that is in and out, in and out, because you don't think you're performing up to speed, I want to give you some really good news. Just stay in Christ. Just believe, and you're accepted. And that's enough. And it'll be enough for now. It'll be enough for today, your past, and your future. And for those of you that sometimes maybe are just kind of thinking that God doesn't really care whether you live a godly life, I want you to know he cares. And he wants you to live that kind of a life, not to, to jump hoops for him, but because you are the bride of Christ. And you are being prepared for the eventuality of that union with your Savior for all of eternity. So his goal is forgiveness of our sins and reconciliation with God. And the motive for our redemption is the riches of his grace that the Bible says in verse 8 that he lavished on us. He lavished it on us. I don't know if you've ever struggled with this, but sometimes I've thought of God as in the past, especially as a younger Christian, because I, if, of the two extremes, I, I tend to be the one that I just mentioned a minute ago. I tend to be the one that wants to kind of stay in. I want to kind of, I want to please the Lord. I want to honor him. I want to walk in a way that's worthy. But instead of it always being simply an overflow of this relationship, sometimes it's the genesis of it where I'm trying to win God's favor when it's already been won. And so when it talks about God lavishing me and lavishing you as a believer with this grace of his, which means unmerited favor, I, I'm just, I have to park on that because I have trouble completely comprehending that. You know why? Because sometimes in my Christian life, I've thought of God as just kind of giving me scraps, you know, kind of tossing some stuff out, just enough to keep me coming, but not enough to keep me satisfied. I, you don't need to raise your hands, but I'm assuming there's some of you that are a bit like that. Like, like you have to beg God. Like, you've really got to be on his porch all the time asking for help for things, and he's just kind of, it's just squeaking out, you know. It's just like he's, like he's doling out these little scraps to us to, to keep us there, to, to remind us that he's truly sovereign, he can answer prayer, but not enough for us to have total confidence in him. But this passage blows that false understanding out of the water because God lavishes on you his grace. He loves to give you his grace. He's not offended that you need his grace. He enjoys it. You guys know I have two sons, and I really love my sons, and I admire my sons, and I want to be like my sons in some respects. I, I, for a long time, I've been teaching them and training them how to be godly men, and now they're, they're teaching me how to be a godly man. I'm learning from them. And, uh, and I, I find myself as a father sometimes meditating and musing on how I can bless my sons. And it's a difficult kind of a balance to, to achieve because I don't want to spoil them, and I don't want to damage the work that God is doing in them by making things too easy for them. But at the same time, in my heart, I would love to just dump on them everything. I really would. And, uh, and I have to control myself to not give too much because that's really my heart. So they have jobs, they, they make their own money, they pay for a lot of their own activities. They're learning how to be responsible and how to provide for themselves and their future families. But there's still something in, their, in the heart of me as a father that I just want to bless them. And I think of things, and it's just like, I'm, I'm like, seriously, I'm creative, and I'm thinking, how can I bless my sons? What can I do today? How can I express my love in a different way? How can I communicate my, my excitement about being their father? And what can I tangibly do to make their life better and more meaningful? And what opportunities can I open up to them that they seem to be expressing interest in that they might really flourish in, and who knows what might come of it? And so we buy some things sometimes, and we take them places, and we open up doors for them to, to be blessed. And I think to myself, Bob, if, if I am so evil and wicked, and I've got that kind of a heart toward my kids, then I think, how much more? Is the Heavenly Father, I'm, you know, I know God doesn't sleep, but I think in my mind, when I'm, when I'm, when I'm sleeping, and he's awake at night thinking, how can I bless that guy? You know, what can I do now? What can I do to blow them away next, you know? And God is doing the same for you. You know, the Bible says that, that his thoughts toward us are more than the sand of the sea. And they're not bad thoughts. He's not like counting our problems. 
and counting our sins. He's counting his joy in knowing us and having relationship with us. He really, really loves you. He really does. And that's so hard for us to accept because we know what we're like. But that's why it's so important, the recognition that he didn't choose us because of who we are. He chose us because he decided to. And there's no other explanation except that God himself has made it possible for us to experience this kind of love. And so Romans tells us that he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? And so church, I just want to encourage you. God is not doling out scraps to you. But God is kind of like me as a dad and like you as a father or a mom where you don't want to do too much and spoil your kids and ruin them. To give them too much, too quickly, too easily would be damaging. But your heart is to pour it out and give everything you can. And so you almost have to restrain yourself. And I think the Bible is pretty clear that God has this heart, but at times he restrains himself so that he doesn't spoil the men and women he's making us to be. Mature and strong and fully complete in Jesus Christ. And in addition to that, if it wasn't enough that he gave us these things, it says in addition, he gives it with all wisdom and understanding. Some people have thought that, that God was expressing wisdom and understanding, but that doesn't make sense because later on he's going to talk about the fact that Paul's praying for the church to grow in wisdom and understanding. And of course, God doesn't need to grow in wisdom and understanding. He's perfect in knowledge already. So what he's saying is in addition to this outpouring of his lavish grace on us and his patience toward us and his kindness, I, 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 God's not mad at you. Do you know that? If you're a believer... God, God is not mad at you. He's not angry with you. He loves you. And in the midst of that, he says, I want you in addition to have all wisdom and understanding. Wisdom is a, is a base of knowledge about God. Where do we get that? We get it from the word of God. Wisdom comes from this book on how we can live a godly life. And knowledge is the application of this wisdom to our daily life. Those two things come together, and when a believer begins to live this way, it's explosive and life-changing, not only for the believer, but for people who observe this person's life. And we become a fragrant aroma of Christ. It's God's heart that we experience this. He wants you to walk in the wisdom of God and the understanding of God so that you can live this Christian life to its fullest and enjoy the graces that God has given us in Christ. In verse 9 and 10, he goes on and he uh, continues on his teaching here. And he says, And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment. And so there's a mystery that's being revealed to us here. And it was a mystery of the Old Testament. And you know what the mystery was? The book of Colossians tells us what it is. It's Christ. He's the mystery. Christ is the mystery. The Old Testament saints couldn't understand how it would be possible that God and man could have the relationship that they once enjoyed in the garden. The only, the only relationship they had was in this distant relationship that came through the priests and the Levites, and only one man once a year could go into the inner sanctum of the Holy of Holies and have that relationship, and it wasn't even face-to-face, -face. not like a man and a man meeting, not like the garden. And so the mystery for the Old Testament saints is how is God possibly going to pull this off? Well, we know that when Christ died on the cross, the, the temple curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the outer court was torn signifying that any man and any woman now had access to the temple of God. But this went a step farther. Because God says, not only do you have access to the temple, but you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. I don't know if you've ever given consideration to that thought, that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. I find it remarkable that Jesus Christ would go to the cross for me. I, I'm going to spend the rest of eternity trying to understand what that means and, and understand the grace that caused that to even occur. But one of the things that I don't think we give much consideration to is the third person of the Trinity and what he has to put up with. 
because the Bible tells us that he now dwells in us. The person who believes and is in Christ, one of the benefits that we're going to talk about next week is that we receive the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. And we now are not only in Christ, but now the Holy Spirit resides in us. And wherever I go in this fallen body, the Bible says that my mind and my spirit is restored and renewed in Christ, but my body is lagging behind. This is the dilemma Paul talks about in Romans chapter 7. I can't, I can't get my, my body to do what my mind wants to do, what my spirit wants to do. And I find myself stumbling and falling. Why? Because our, our flesh, this body is not yet redeemed. When it's redeemed and matches this new spirit, new nature in Christ, the battle will be over. And that's when he comes for us, is when he restores our body. That battle will be forever finished. The, the struggle against sin, the, the dynamic of the consequences and the challenges that we live in the world and experience here will be over. But until then, what I find so remarkable is that the Holy Spirit consents to live in my heart. And whatever I do and whatever I say and wherever I go and whatever I allow my eyes to view, whatever happens in me, the Holy Spirit is, a, is the quiet partner in the whole deal. And that's a daunting thought. But even more so, I'm blown away by the kindness of the Holy Spirit to consent to that role of humility. To be willing as a pure and holy aspect of the nature of God, the per third person of the Trinity, to be willing to consent to live in unredeemed flesh. And yet, this is what the Bible tells us that he does. So the mystery that Paul is talking about is this mystery of Christ in us, the hope of glory. It was revealed to the prophets, but now it's revealed to us, and it was motivated by one thing, his good pleasure. It just made him happy to do it. it. It just makes God happy to bless you. Did you know that? That's the heart of the Father. You know, he's like us probably, I think, in, in clearly in Scripture. It grieves him to discipline us and blesses him to, when he gets to bless us. He loves to pour out his blessings on us. He doesn't like disciplining us any more than I like disciplining my kids, any more than you like disciplining your kids. But he does it because he knows it's necessary. And yet his desire is the good pleasure is simply to pour out on you. And so we need to change our minds. I need to change my mind about this concept of who God is from this God that simply kind of gives us the bits and scraps that, that are left over, just enough to keep us coming, but not enough to satisfy. That's not the heart of God at all. And the timing of this mystery is when times will have reached their fulfillment. It's a reference when the time was ripe or a precise moment in human history. And it refers to the coming of Christ. And at that time when Christ comes, he will bring all things under Christ in heaven and on earth. And everyone, young, old, men, woman, believer, unbeliever, everyone will bow the knee to Christ. And they will submit to him. But for those of us that have believed in Christ prior to his coming, we will be found in Christ. And the Father will draw us into his eternal kingdom because of Christ. And as Christ goes for us and returns with us, we enter into that eternal relationship with God. Verse 11 and 12 tell us a little bit more. He goes on and says, In him, you notice the same phrase again and again, In Christ we were also chosen, having been predestined, according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. We've already talked about being chosen and predestined, but I want to talk for just a moment about this concept of time and God working out his eternal purpose. I memorized this passage uh, many years ago, and I remember as I was getting to this particular verse in verse 11 and, uh, and 12, I was stunned because I got stuck on the fact that it was according to the plan of God who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. And the word that I got stuck on was everything. And my life changed as a result of this verse. Because I, I started meditating on that, and I said, everything works out in conformity with the purpose of his will. Everything. That means everything. I mean, I, I, there's nothing that's not included in everything. So that means my life and even my history, where I was born, the parentage I had, you know, my siblings, my, my good experiences, my bad experiences, everything is going to find its conformity to these eternal purposes of God. Things that I had no control over. The person I married, 
which I'm so happy about. But, you know, it doesn't always go well. You know, sometimes things are, are tough in marriage. Sometimes your kids don't always behave you the way you'd like them to. Sometimes your life doesn't go the way you expect it to. Sometimes there's some catastrophes and some crises and some travesties in life. But the Bible says here that God the Father in his power and his sovereignty forces and makes everything work in conformity with the purpose of his will. Everything fits like a puzzle. But just because I don't understand where the piece fits yet doesn't mean it's not true. And sometimes we struggle with that. And we're thinking, how could God let this happen? Why would God allow this to occur in my life? And you've been through some terrible things that I could never justify or explain as being the initiative of God because they aren't. But we live in a fallen, sinful world where we have been touched in some very painful ways by the consequences of sin. Sometimes our own and sometimes the sin of other people. But in the midst of this, we have a promise that God says, that God, as those are in Christ, this is the promise to believers, for those that are in Christ, he's going to work out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. Do you know how much comfort that brings? That means that I can relax about things that are maybe never going to be solved on this planet. That means that I can relax about our present government and decisions that are made. That means I can relax about all the stuff that's going on in our county council and with our mayor and our police officers. I can relax about all this. Why? Because God and his sovereignty is driving forward human history toward its culmination of the fulfillment of all prophecy and all in Christ. It's coming to pass. And so as a believer, and as you, as, as we as a church are believers, we can entrust ourselves completely to the wisdom of God because he works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. And as a result of that, we can take claim to Romans 8.28 that you guys are very familiar with, is that we know in all things God works for the good of those that love him and have been called according to his purpose. And his purpose is our Christ-likeness. He has an agenda. Sometimes it's different than ours. We want peace and comfort and protection. We want all these things. And what God wants is he wants a kingdom of men and women who are a part of his bride who are being prepared for eternal glory. Paul finishes by talking finally in verse 12, in order that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. I've been thinking a lot about uh, my relationship with God recently. We had a prayer retreat with the Bible College this weekend, Friday and Saturday up at Naui. It was awesome. And I uh, love the Bible College. Thank you guys for being here, being a part of our fellowship. Um, yeah, that's, they're awesome. But one of the things we had a kind of a long discussion about uh, in several different discussions was, was what God is really after. What is Jesus Christ really after? Sometimes, because of my personality and my character and my giftings, I think God is after filling his kingdom with worshipers. Is that true? Yeah, he is. Does he want people to be saved? Absolutely. Does he want people to be rescued from hell and, and to experience the abundance that Paul is laying out here in, in Ephesians chapter 1? Of course he does. He wants all that. And so because of that, sometimes in my thinking as a pastor and just the way I'm wired, I think sometimes of myself almost like as an employee of God, carrying out his work. And, you know, yes, sir, tell me what to do. No questions, sir. Whatever you tell me what to do, I'm going to do it. I don't care what it costs me. I don't care what the price is. I'm going, to, I'm going to do whatever you tell me to do. And sometimes in my mind, I think of myself as an employee of God. I know he's my master. I know that he's my friend. I know I'm a servant. I know I'm his son, and I know I'm his friend. But I still sometimes seem to gravitate toward this work relationship with God. And, and, it, and it, it's been dawning on me more and more over the last five, six years or so that I've got that completely wrong. And that what God is really after is me. And he's after you. He wants a relationship with us. This is his premier work, is, is not conquering the world. His premier work isn't, isn't stomping on Satan and undoing the damage that he's done all these millennia. His premier work is the body of Christ. His premier work, if I can put it in this term, is you as the bride of Christ. His premier work is preparing you as the church for his son, for this eventuality of union eternally with Christ. You. 
I'm not saying you're the center of the universe by any stretch, but I'm saying that his affection is set on you. And this is the driving passion of the heart of God and the heart of the Son and the heart of the Holy Spirit. And by virtue of this passion and this love that he has for you, because of his own choice that we can't fully explain, and the grace that's poured out on us, his focus is not on what you can produce for his kingdom and what, you, what great things that you can do to bring more people in and to see, you know, the kingdom of God explode and, and to, you know, have more fruit and more rewards. That's not his primary goal. His, those are part of his, his work. And they're the overflow, but they're overflow of a relationship with Jesus Christ. That is his agenda. And I just want to challenge you just for a moment here as we kind of uh, begin to kind of wrap this up, is that what is your relationship with God really like? You know, one of the problems the church in Ephesus had in Revelation chapter 2 when Jesus Christ addressed this particular church is he said, man, you're doing all the right things. You, are, you guys are knocking it out of the park. You are obeying me. You are sharing the gospel. You're evangelizing. You're holding to the truths of the faith. You are suffering for my name's sake. And then he says, but you've forgotten one thing. And I would say they forgot the most important thing. You've turned this into an employee-employer relationship. And I'm not looking for employees. I'm looking for a bride. I was, um, I was commenting last night during church when we had our Saturday service, and I was sharing with the church that uh, how devastating I think it would be for a woman to be courted by a man to get married, and then five years later discover some emails where he's communicating with one of his buddies and just says, yeah, I don't really, how did we meet? Well, you know, this and that and the other thing, and I don't, how was I attracted? I wasn't really attracted to her. I didn't, she's kind of on the ugly side, actually, and, and uh, not really the kind of person I really like that much, and our personalities clash. Really can't stand her. But, man, is she a good administrator, and I'm so bad at administration in my business, it was failing. I knew I needed to find somebody that was really good at accounting, could keep a calendar, and knew how to get things done, and that's why I married her. Can you imagine as a woman stumbling across an email like that? It'd be devastating, and I think to myself, in my own warped mind that doesn't fully comprehend all of this, I think in, in some ways that's what I've done in my relationship with God. I, I've turned it sometimes into this work ethic that I need to somehow now carry on with the purposes of God and fulfill this commission and be a good employee for God. And all the while, God is saying, I don't want a worker. I want you. I want your heart. I want you to love me like I love you. I want you to lavish on me the kind of affection I'm lavishing on you. I want you to be enthralled with me. I want you to be stunned by me. I want you to know me. I want you to be filled with my wisdom and my understanding. I want to share with you and reveal everything to you if you're willing. I want you. Yeah, we're going to work. Becky and I make a great team. But I didn't marry her because she's an administrator, but she is a great administrator, by the way. But I think she's beautiful. I, I love being with her. She's got a great sense of humor. I appreciate everything about her. And God brought us together. But the bonus is, is that we are a team together doing the work of the Lord. The bonus of being in relationship with Christ is everything else. But what God is after is, is the heart of a man or a woman that simply wants to fall in love with him. And it says that this is to the praise of the glory of God, that the bride would feel this way about the king. I, I was kind of envisioning this. And I was envisioning, though, we're in a courting process right now. We, we're betrothed to Jesus Christ in this waiting period until he comes for us. But we're preparing ourselves as a bride. We're preparing our hearts for this, this union with Christ, this eternal experience with him. And, and even though I'm rushing it a little bit in terms of the, the sequence of events, I almost imagine us, you know, kind of preparing ourselves. And I do a lot of weddings, and I, I love being there with the groom and standing with him, having already prayed. And the groom is looking as the bride. He sees her first usually because he's facing that way. And he sees the bride coming from a far distance, and his eyes light up, and he's looking at her, and he's saying, wow, here she comes. And I'm like, 
wow, here she comes. And we both watch this woman coming down the aisle together. And what does the congregation do once they hear the music and they realize she's in the house? They stand, and who are they looking at? Not the groom. They, they don't care about the groom. They're standing, and they're looking at the bride. And everybody stands up, and there's the bride, and the, uh, the groom is there, and the pastor's there, and if, you know, and, but everybody's looking at her, and they're, oh, <sighs> wow, wow. Look at her. And what God is saying in this text is that when you as the bride of Christ take your proper role and you begin this long march, this, this blessed experience of, of coming toward your groom, having prepared yourself, having washed yourself, having put on the righteous raiment of Christ, the clothing of Jesus Christ, and as you make your way down that aisle, who's watching? The world's watching. And as the world looks upon the bride of Christ, as we make our final steps and our final process to be united with our king and our, our groomsmen, when that happens, the world watches. And as you come down that aisle in front of your friends and your neighbors, and as they see you walking day by day and setting your heart apart for Christ, as they see, they don't want to see people that are hard workers. They're already hard workers. They're tired. They want to see somebody in love. They want to see somebody whose, whose life is impassioned by intimacy with Christ. They don't want religion. They've tried that, and it's exhausting. It wears people out trying to be good enough. But when they see a, a woman in love with a man, it's enthralling, and it's motivating, and it's moving. And churches, as the world watches you make your way, in these final days before the coming of Christ, for this eventuality of this union, they need to see not an exhausted church, not a worn-out church, not people who are, are still trying to win the approval. I mean, why are you, oh, I hope he marries me, I hope he marries me. He's standing there waiting for you already. It's already done. And as the world watches that, God says, as you come in Christ, it's to the praise of the glory of the groom for the world to see the quality of this bride. You are an awesome people because God in Christ has raised you up and seated you in the heavenly realms in Christ. And having been found in Christ, you are now the bride, the treasured possession of Jesus Christ. Yeah, he got you out of a pawn shop. He did. And he redeemed us. Our beginnings weren't so glorious, but now we're walking the aisle. It's an amazing thing he's done for us, and he's lavished on, on us. And the moment that that union takes place, the Bible says that everything that was ours is now his. And what was ours? Debt. Creditors calling. The phone constantly ringing trying to find us. But Jesus Christ said, I've got that covered. And in addition, check out the place I prepared for you. And you're going to be co-inheritors of all that's mine that the Father's given to me. And it's ours together for eternity. This is your calling. This is your destiny. This is your privilege. And your king is coming. Be ready. And focus on intimacy with him. We're told in Matthew 6, 33, saying the same thing in a slightly different way. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Fall in love with Jesus, and all these other things will find their proper place because they'll all be brought into conformity with the purpose of your God and your king. Nothing will be wasted, and he's always on time, and he'll be on time for you too. Father, we thank you for this time this morning and for your word. Uh, we love how kind you are to us, God. And even sharing this message this morning is a real joy for me because as I talk about these things, my heart gets stirred up. My heart gets stirred up to want to love you more, to be less of an employee and, and to be the person that you called me to be as the bride of Christ. Yes, a friend. Yes, a son. But the bride... That's a very special place that you've called us to be. 
And we want to say thank you for having raised us up from such poor beginnings into such a place of honor and joy. And I pray for every man and woman here, God, that you would set our hearts free from being religious or trying hard or trying to be good and simply to fall in love with you and let this newfound relationship with you transform us from the inside out by the work of your spirit in a way that's freeing and wonderful and exciting and invigorating and life-changing. And may it all be to your glory and praise to the glorious grace of our King and Savior, Jesus Christ. As the world looks on, may they see a church that's filled with joy. May they see a bride that's excited about this wedding that's about to take place. And God, may you further increase the numbers in our ranks in the days to come that more and more might be able to enjoy this profound and wonderful relationship in Christ. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand as we close our service? And we're going to.